In evaluating any theory, we need to search as hard as we can for evidence against it. And in the case of our dual process theory of moral judgment, it's fortunate that we could find some. So let, remind, let me remind you of the basic idea. We're not taking exactly Green or Cushman or anyone else's model. We're using something much more stripped down than you can find anywhere in the literature. Our idea is that there are two or more processes which are distinct in the sense that which outcomes they generate will depend differently on various contextual factors like content time pressure, cognitive load and so on, and the relations between the processes and the responses likewise. Furthermore, one of those is faster than the other in the technical sense that it consumes less scarce cognitive resources like working memory. So that's our core dual process theory. But if you remember, we also need, in order to generate predictions that align us with the available evidence, an auxiliary hypothesis. And this turned out to be quite a big deal. And what I did in the end was just to pick one, uh, which I thought was perhaps the uh, uh, one of the weakest hypotheses we could pick that would still generate relevant predictions. So I don't think there's a weaker claim that we can make here. This was the hypothesis that the only the slow process ever flexibly and rapidly takes into account differences in the distal outcomes of an action. Only the slow process will ever flexibly and rapidly take into account differences in the distal outcomes of an action. So both processes should care whether or not an action, for example, is a killing, that would be a fairly proximal outcome of the action. But if the killing then does one thing, for example, stops a moving tram, that does another thing, uh, that does another thing that saves five lives, that would be a more distal outcome further down the chain of cause and effect, means and end. Uh, and those more distal outcomes, the saving five lives in this case, it's unlikely, I think, that the fast process would take them into account. So anyway, the auxiliary hypothesis. Let's see though. Can we find some evidence against it? Well, Bago and Denays offer an interesting study. Uh, and if you have time, I do encourage you to read this because they've got a, the introduction citing fabulous range of literature as well. It's quite informative. So they have a submarine scenario. This should be fairly familiar. I don't know why they've used a submarine instead of the more traditional trolley. But anyway, um, one of their scenarios is the submarine scenario. You're responsible for the mission of a submarine leading from a control center on the beach. An onboard explosion has collapsed the only access corridor between upper and lower levels of the ship. Water's quickly approaching to the upper level of the ship. If nothing is done, 12 people in the upper level will be killed, right? In the normal case. Now in the extreme case, they make the ratio different and they have 60 people. The only way for you to save these people is to hit a switch. Aha, there you go. It's a switch. To hit a switch, in which case the path of the water to the upper level will be blocked and it will enter the lower level of the submarine instead. Gosh, I think I've seen this causal structure somewhere before. However, you realise that your brother, now this is the family case, there's also an impersonal case where it's not your brother. However, you realise that your brother and three other people are trapped in the lower level. If you hit the switch, your brother and the three other people um, in the lower level will die otherwise they'd survive. Right, okay, so what's, going, what's the deal? Would you hit the switch? Would you hit the switch? Well, let's take a look here. So uh, there's two variables. One is that you can be in the uh, normal case with just 12 versus four, or the extreme case, 60 versus four. So the ratio of killing to saving changes. Uh, the other thing that can vary is that it, it's not always your brother. As I said, sometimes it's not your brother, and that's the impersonal case. When it's your brother, that's the family case. Now, what's the experiment? Interestingly, they measure two responses to a single scenario. This is a brilliant technique. So what they do is they give you some uh, task. It's a task involving recognizing dot patterns. So you have a task and you have to start that task. So you're under some cognitive load because now you've got to hold something in memory. And they get you to respond under time pressure as well. So you've got a limited time window to respond. You read the dilemma, you give your first response. Let's give a confidence judgment. Now you complete the cognitive load task. Ooh, take a breath. Relax now, you've got as much time as you want, you're not doing anything else. What I'd like you to do is to give a second response, no time pressure, no cognitive load to the dilemma. So they're measuring what you what your first response is and what your second response is. Let's think about what our predictions might be. So if we take the auxiliary hypothesis that only the slow process ever flexibly and rapidly takes into account differences in the outcomes of an action. And we also think that manipulating time pressure and cognitive load ought to 
ensure that the slow process is less dominant if over that first response than the second response, what would we predict? Well, I guess the classic prediction would be we're going to predict that the first response will not take into account the live saved in the same way that the second response will. Uh, because you think of switching the water as more immediately killing. Now, I do have some reservations about exact, applying exactly that reasoning to the dialogue with the submarine that you have just seen, but I think it's I think that's that's a fair game. That's fair game. So what we're predicting is that the first response will be more dominated by the fast process than the second response, and therefore that the first response will involve less taking into account these distal outcomes, so the number of lives saved overall than that second response. So we might predict, uh, sorry, that is the prediction. That's the prediction. I've just told you what it is. Well done. Let's take a look at their data. So first of all, how many people are giving what they're calling a utilitarian response to both first and second time they're asked? Uh, so these are responses where you're saving the maximum number of people. And what they're finding here, I don't know if you can see this, but they're finding about 74% of the participants are giving that response in the case where the family isn't involved and they are killing four to save, save 12. Now, um, how many people are doing the opposite? So they're consistently uh, not pressing the switch, both responses, roughly 10%. All right, that's interesting. What we're interested in though is the switches. So are we going to find are we going to find that there are some switches? Now, this is the pattern we're not expecting. So what's happening here is that people are under time pressure and cognitive load saying, gosh, you know what? I'm going to save the large number of people, but then switching and saying, actually, I'm not going to press the switch after all. Now, that's exactly the opposite of what we'd expect. Uh, so about 6% of people are doing that. Here's what we might be expecting if the auxiliary hypothesis is true. These people who first of all are saying, no, 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 I'm not going to press the switch. And then they're like, oh, actually, I've got a bit more time on reflection probably going to save more people. Sorry about the folks in the lower deck. Uh, and that's about 11%. All right, so that's that's the response we're expecting. What you notice straight away, this is really the message from um, this study, Bago and Denae's, um, very few people are actually doing that switch. Very few people are correcting their responses. And as you go through the study, they're computing a, uh, a non-correction rate. So how many people are sticking with their uh, consequentialist response right from the start. What you're finding is that you can you can vary how many people are consequentialist. So when you introduce family members, very few people are prepared to press the switch. It's all right if more people die. I can't be responsible for the death of my brother. I can't be responsible for the death of my brother. But still, what you're not finding is a big switch. What you're not finding is a big switch. So you're, you're flipping the baseline down. A lot of people are no longer giving what they're calling the utilitarian response. But it's not changing after that time pressure is released. It's not changing when people have got enough time. Um, changing the ratio doesn't make much difference either. So what's the message from all of these studies? The message from all of these studies is very simple. Although there were some instances in which deliberate correction occurred, these were the exception rather than the rule. Across the studies, results consistently showed that in the vast majority of cases in which people opt for a consequentialist response after deliberation, the consequentialist response was already given in the initial phase. Hmm. Interesting. Now, a natural thought at this point is to say, well, I wonder if it could be due to a kind of consistency effect. So having given one response, I look like a bit of a numpty if I then change it when I'm asked the question again, right? I've already answered it, why should I change my mind? And Bagel and Denise consider this response. I'm mentioning their study because I think it's quite a careful study. They consider this response and they note this. In a pilot study, they found that in one of the dilemmas, they got roughly speaking 85% who, when asked just once, were giving a consequentialist response. So they're asked once, they give a consequentialist response. In the main study, when people are asked twice, they find the same 84 roughly percent giving the consequentialist response right away. So it looks like if we were looking for consistency effects here, we would expect that the proportion of people giving a consequentialist response would change when they were asked the question twice versus when they were just asked, asked it once. But it doesn't seem to have an effect there.
So it doesn't seem that we can explain this via consistency effects. I do have some reservations about this study. Um, I'm particularly concerned that the submarine scenario means that it's not really clear that it's like the trolley scenario where you're a bystander, maybe tapping into a different causal structure. When you're the submarine commander, you're kind of responsible for the deaths, whatever happens. However, uh, so it's not really clear to me that there is the relevant difference in outcomes that we need for the auxiliary hypothesis to lock onto them. However, what you'll notice is they, they also studied a, a scenario from, from green as well, and that one didn't work either. So the auxil auxiliary hypothesis says only the slow process ever flexibly and rapidly takes into account differences in the outcomes of an action. And what we find here is that Suter and Hertwig, I showed you this before, they provide positive evidence for that hypothesis and Bago and Denaise provide evidence which does not confirm the prediction of the hypothesis. So let me just remind you about Suter and Hertwig. Uh, I've shown you this a couple of times now. In their study, they contrasted a no time pressure with a time pressure condition. And what they found is that when they gave people uh, the standard trolley type dilemmas, they were less utilitarian when they had to respond more quickly. They were less utilitarian when they had to respond more quickly. Uh, so given that finding, I think it's reasonable to expect that in the Bega and Dine's study, we would find that the first response, people would be less consequentialist, take into account the outcome less, and therefore there would be more switching, assuming they're right that there are no consistency effects. But that's indeed not what they found. That's not what Bega and Dine's found. So there's a nice little contradiction between these two studies. Where do we go with that contradiction? Well, I do have some doubts about the particular dialogues that Bago uh, and Denise used. So I think there is a concern there. On the other hand, um, this is an incredibly careful study and I don't really trust my own objections there. I also note in the introduction, Bago and Denise cite several studies which also fail to find evidence of an effect of time pressure or cognitive load on the in generating increased consequentialist judgments. So that makes me lean towards the idea that we should not trust Suter and Hertwig. Now there is one caveat here. In all of these studies, we're not actually comparing what happens as you shift the outcome. So what we're really saying is this, that as you shift the outcome, change the more distal outcome. So for example, in the more distal case, it should be that, that more people are saved or whatever. Um, we should find that this is differentially influencing fast versus slow processes. So fast processes should be largely immune to shifts in a more distal outcome, whereas slow processes, all things being equal, should take those into account more. And that's not what either of these studies are measuring. So it's far from ideal here. It's far from ideal. But I think on balance, what we can definitely say is that Suter and Hertwig is not something we should be citing as providing evidence in support of our auxiliary hypothesis. So where does that leave us with respect to the auxiliary hypothesis? I wanna say, not that we can say that the auxiliary hypothesis is false. That's not what Bago and Denise have shown. What they've shown is that some of the data that we might have taken to support it doesn't in fact support it, and therefore that we re should regard it as less supported than previously. But hold on, Steve, hold on, Steve. You might say, look, this is too quick, because if you think about the evidence that was provided for that auxiliary hypothesis, there were actually three sources. And what we found is that I think Suter and Hertwig, that isn't something that we should cite now as evidence in favor of this study could turn out to be, but as things stand on balance, it looks like that's not promising evidence. We also saw reasons to think that Tremolair and Bonifon also isn't standing up as evidence in support of it. But we had the brilliant process dissociation study provided to us by Conway and Goronsky. So given that we have that study, which I think is an incredibly strong study, shouldn't we still hold on to the auxiliary hypothesis? Hmm. Great question. I'm so glad you asked. You saw this coming along. I, yeah, I, you saw this coming a long time ago, didn't you? So let, let's go back to Conway and Goronsky and see what could possibly go wrong with this third piece of evidence. 
you remember that they use process dissociation. So they have a very simple model of what happens. You're given a moral dilemma and you either give a utilitarian response or you do not. Utilitarian consequentialist, same difference to us here. Now, so what they're assuming is this. There's some probability you that you give the utilitarian response. And then of course, one minus you is the probability that you don't give the utilitarian response. Now, Second thing is this, if you don't give a utilitarian response, it doesn't follow automatically that you're going to give a rule-based or deontological response. This is the brilliant thing about them that Bago and Denise, for some reason, are missing. They don't seem to take taken this on board. It may also be that you give a response which is neither, which is neither. It might be neither utilitarianism nor deontology that drives the response. But look at how they conceptualize this. Conway and Goronsky conceptualized nothing, neither being a consequentialist nor deontologist, as basically just harming in every case, right? Harming in every case. So in order to fit into here in their study, you had to think that in order to prevent a paint bomb going off, it's okay to kill someone, um, which I suppose is a view that you might have, um, but it, it's not super plausible. A natural thought at this point is, well, look, if you put me under time pressure, say you're like Steve, you know, which car are you going to buy? You're going to buy the red car, you're going to buy the blue car. Uh, what are you going to do? If you put me under time pressure, I'd be very tempted just not to act, right? That might be a sensible thing to do. If I'm under time pressure, maybe I just shouldn't act at all. So here's a reasonable thought. It's not that I'm just going to harm people regardless, right? It might be that I'm neither going to be utilitarian nor deontological deontological, because the right thing to do if I'm under a lot of time pressure and the stakes are high is simply to hold back and don't act, right? That might be a very good rule of thumb for me to follow. And what you see here is that that possibility is missing. There's no situation in which I am not harming. I'm finding the harm unacceptable in both the congruent and the incongruent dilemma. I'm failing to act. What Goronsky and colleagues did in a later study, therefore, is to introduce that additional possibility. So now, as well as the uh, default of always acting. There's a further default, which is never acting. So they call this the CNI, consequences, norms, and inaction model, the CNI model, consequences, norms, and inaction. And what you can see here is it gets very complicated. So as you introduce an additional possibility, the number of uh, scenarios that you have to consider increases exponentially. And that's why this stuff is incredibly uh, incredibly difficult. Essentially, you're dealing with a truth table like structure in order to infer back those probabilities. Every time you add a different probability to your uh, model, it's like adding a different, uh, add, adding, a, adding a new place to your truth function. All right, good. Uh, so what happens if we test the more elaborate model? Well, what Goronsky and colleagues did was indeed just that. So they tested the sensitivity to consequences, sensitivity to norms, and uh, tendency to be inactive, those three parameters. And what they found was very interesting. Changing the load with the more advanced model gave us a different result from Conway and Goronsky. What they found essentially was that low versus high load did not change sensitivity to consequences significantly, did not, and you can see if anything, it's going the wrong direction here. Oops. Uh, no, sorry, it's going the right direction, but there's, there's no significant difference. Uh, it did not change sensitivity to norms at all. Now, that's also what Conway and Goronsky found, so no surprises there. The significant difference was only people's tendency to inaction. So what Goronsky and colleagues found is that the difference between that low load and the high load seems to be explained by this idea that when you're under high load, you prefer not to act at all. They put it like this. The only significant effect in these studies was a significant increase in participants' general preference for inaction as a result of cognitive load. Cognitive load, they said, did not affect participants' sensitivity to morally relevant consequences. So the general idea they've got is this. Cognitive load influences moral dilemmas by enhancing emission bias, let's just not act, not by reducing sensitivity to consequences. Instead of reducing participant sensitivity to consequences, cognitive load increased general preferences for inaction. Now that's a problem, I think, because Conway and Goronsky previously 
we could regard as providing quite strong evidence for our auxiliary hypothesis that only the slow process would flexibly and rapidly respond to uh, differences in distal outcomes. But it looks like with the new research, Goronsky et al. 2017, where they introduced the possibility of an action, we should no longer accept this finding because the two things conflict. That's not to say that Conway and Goronsky are necessarily wrong. It's just that where we've got that conflicting evidence, the uh, thing to do here is to recognize that we don't have justification either way. We're in a situation where we lack justification. We can't say that we have evidence for the dual process uh, theory with this auxiliary hypothesis. So folks, now we're in a terrifically interesting position. What we've seen is that there's an apparent conflict between two studies, one of which seems to support the auxiliary hypothesis, the other which appears not to support the auxiliary hypothesis. A natural question at this point is whether we could resolve that apparent contradiction by preference for inaction under time pressure. And the answer is that we can't do that. Why can't we do that? Because the effect of a preference for inaction under time pressure should have been the same in the case of both studies. So we shouldn't find that they conflict in the pattern that they provide. So there is, I think, a hard to explain conflict between those two studies. But now look what happens as we introduce the Goronsky et al. study with the consequences, norms and inaction, CNI model, that they have for process dissociation. Now we've got Suter and Hedvig who are contradicting each other, but also, this is interesting, Bago and Denais are finding something which is incompatible with Goronsky and colleagues. Why is that? Well, according to Goronsky and colleagues, introducing low cognitive load or time pressure should indeed make people less consequentialist because they have a general preference for inaction. That was their finding. But if that were true, then Bago and Denais would have measured that. They would have seen that because in their study, they treat what they call deontological judgments as a combination of either being deontologi deontologist or just generally preferring not to act at all. So that preference for inaction should actually have caused them to find results which appeared to support the auxiliary hypothesis of our stripped down dual process theory. So here's what's really curious and interesting and puzzling. Um, Bago and Denais and Goronsky and colleagues can't both be right, although if either of them are right, they undermine different bits of the evidence in favour of the auxiliary hypothesis. If you're thinking, you know, I'm sure that Steve has explained this brilliantly, but I'm confused, you're wrong. You're wrong. I'm confused about this. I'm very confused. We've got conflicting evidence here. We've got conflicting evidence here. And it's doubly confusing because this is evidence which is undermining evidence in favor of a theory. So our situation, I think, is one that's very difficult to comprehend. And my aim here is not to try to explain things to you so much as to say to you that there's a lot of work that you need to do in evaluating this evidence. There's a lot of work that you need to do in evaluating this evidence. If you want the simple picture, the answer is this. Evidence which we might have taken, and indeed I did suggest earlier last week, to support the auxiliary hypothesis that only the slow process ever flexibly and rapidly takes into account differences in the distal outcomes of actions, does not actually now strongly support this hypothesis. The evidence as we currently have it is not super strong for this, uh, which is unfortunate. But that's not to say that we found evidence against it either. It's not that we've tested the predictions of this hypothesis and we found evidence to disconfirm those predictions. So I think rather we might say that this auxiliary hypothesis currently is unsupported. That doesn't mean, of course, that the stripped down dual process theory itself is wrong. One possibility is that the auxiliary hypothesis we already have is true. We just don't have the right evidence for it. And I think that's fair enough because I think a lot of the studies that we have are not the kind of studies which in other domains have provided robust evidence in favor of dual process theories. Um, there are various problems with these studies, including the fact that we're trying to measure the operations of a fast process by giving people things to read and therefore fairly 
serious amounts of processing time. We've got fairly limited control over processing time in lots of these studies. So it's too early to give up on the auxiliary hypothesis, but it would be reasonable at this point to think to ourselves, well, what alternative auxiliary hypothesis might we have? Maybe what we need is to take away the idea that it's outcomes that really matter and think about some other feature of moral judgments. What I can tell you, I won't work through this with you, but I can tell you if you want to work through it for yourself, go for it. Any of the other auxiliary hypotheses that we might have selected, apart from the one about emotion, which I think is untenable on theoretical grounds, the idea that is that fast processes are effective whereas slow processes are cognitive. Um, of course, emotion matters for our slow processes as well. Any of the other of those six candidate auxiliary hypotheses won't fare any better with respect to the conflict in the data that we have now. So here's the deal. It's too early to give up on the stripped down dual process theory of moral cognition. There is currently no better account, nor have we yet found convincing evidence against it. But we certainly shouldn't be confident that we have strong evidence in favor of it either. In particular, we shouldn't have strong conviction contra Green and colleagues that we know what distinguishes the fast from the slow process. We do not know that. 